Heavenly Father, you've caused these things to be written down for every generation and for us who live at the end of this world's history. So would you guide our thoughts? Would you guide my voice and my thoughts? Would, would your Holy Spirit please come and fill this room and bless each one of us, direct us toward your eternal kingdom? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to start off with a story that kind of illustrates things. <clears throat> and I had an opportunity this past week, we can go to the next slide now if you want, <clears throat> uh, to um, watch a program on a new telescope. Did you know that there's a new space telescope that uh, was launched about last December or January? Uh, it is called the James Webb Space Telescope. And I thought I, it, there's a picture of it there on your handout. And um, it's really very unique. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, being referred to as the next generation telescope. And it has been in design and construction for the past 15 years. The past 15 years while we have been blessed to be able to look into space through the Hubble telescope which has been the best thing up to now. Now we have something that is even uh, bigger and better than that. It, is cost, it costs about $10 billion, and I don't know how much that is, you know, to be honest with you, but it sounds like a lot of money. And in, there are, altogether, there are 20 countries, people from 20 countries that have banded together uh, to make that project a reality. <clears throat> launched last December. Now it is one million miles away from Earth. Can you imagine? One million miles away from Earth, and it's able to send back pictures to, that we can look at here. <clears throat> its primary reflecting surface is made up of 18 hexagonal mirrors, altogether about the size of a tennis court. It's coated with an extremely fine layer of gold. <clears throat> Beneath the telescope, you can see there on your handout, are five layers of um, um, heat insulation that enables the mirror's surface to maintain a constant temperature of minus 370 degrees, which is necessary for infrared photography. Each layer of that heat shield, each of those five layers, is the thickness of a human hair. That's pretty thin. <clears throat> the, uh, those layers are actually shielding the uh, telescope from the heat that it generates itself, the heat of the earth and the heat of the sun, so that it'll stay cool and be able to uh, get better images. It has six times the power of the Hubble telescope and can t detect objects that are 100 times fainter than what the Hubble telescope could see. <clears throat> and uh, this is just one of the pictures right here. This is, um, the pictures have started coming back to us just this last July. So these are, <clears throat> are kind of hot off the press pictures. And uh, this is a picture of the uh, Carnia Nebula. Uh, 8,500 light years away, is that far enough away for you? Can you believe we can see something that is that far away? And this is just one tiny little speck. Uh, the Carnia Nebula is actually part of the Milky Way. We are a part of the Milky Way. <clears throat> How big is the Milky Way <clears throat> if um, that is in the same galaxy that we are in, and it's 8,500 light years away, the Milky Way galaxy must be pretty big, don't you think? I think I have another picture here as well, that uh, this is the Southern Ring Nebula. 2,000 light years away, we're able to see, these are pictures that have just come in, 
um, with greater depth and detail than anything the human race has ever seen. And I know these are just, there are more pictures than this, but to me, <clears throat> I watched the documentary on it this past week. I was just astounded. You know what I mean? <clears throat> we are now able to look into space deeper. You know, Abraham never got a chance to see this. You know what I mean? We are able to see the glory of what is there. And I was kind of uh, interested when I watched the documentary that <clears throat> one of the people that was commentating on it said, the universe is beautiful. And it is, isn't it? And I don't know whether that person was, had a Christian background or not, but uh, the universe is beautiful. And uh, God put all of these things out there, you know, created them by the breath of his mouth. <clears throat> and then now I think there's one more picture. And uh, it, we're back to the one that we started with. And uh, so uh, as I looked at a few of these pictures, I just thought <clears throat> about the words to this song. How big is God? You know what I mean? How big is God? You know the song? Though man may strive to go beyond the reach of space, to crawl beyond the distant shimmering stars, the world's a room so small within my master's house, the open sky but a portion of his yard. How big is God? How big and wide his vast domain to try to tell these lips can only start. He's big enough to rule the mighty universe, yet small enough to live within my heart. All I can say is words inspired by God, you know what I mean? And uh, we are able to see these things like the human race has never been able to see them before. You know, and I think, I think maybe God has allowed something like that to encourage us to see that there is a God who created all these things. Even though when you listen to the, the documentary and you listen to some of the uh, uh, <clears throat> people that work in that area. <clears throat> They're trying to look back to find to the very beginning of the Big Bang. <clears throat> well, good luck, you know what I mean? But we believe that God has created all of these things. <clears throat> and I guess, don't send me to a state hospital and give me more meds. But someday you might get a chance to go there. You know what I mean? And that's not a psychotic thought either. You know? <clears throat> but did you know that God has given us something that <clears throat> can look even deeper and further and broader and higher than anything that man could ever make? <clears throat> and be able to look at the things that have eternal importance as well. <clears throat> and that is... This right here. This is able to look deeper and broader and higher and further than anything that God, anything that man has ever made. Did you ever hear, hear the words spoken? I recommend to you, dear friend, the word of God. And that's what I want to invite you with this morning as well. I want to recommend to you, dear friend, the word of God. <clears throat> Second Peter 1 verse 21 tells us this, that holy, it was holy men of God that spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And then in that famous chapter in Psalms, Psalms 119, just a couple verses right here, tells us this about God's word. How can a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed according to your word. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things out of your law. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Oh, how I love your law. Forever, O Lord, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. It is my meditation all the day. I have more understanding than all of my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation 
Thy word is, do you know the rest of that? A lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I hope that that is God's word in your life. A lamp, a teacher, a guide. Whereby we may be cleansed. Whereby we may see wonder, wondrous things. And so today I want to, <clears throat> to do that very thing like that telescope that is able to look so far. Amen. I want to look far. And I want to look deep into God's word this morning. And I want to look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, it's a story that, that needs to be looked at very, very seriously. There are important lessons for us there today. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah actually begins back in Genesis 13 when Abraham and Lot had just come into the land of Canaan. <clears throat> uh, they were very blessed with material blessings and they had a vast number of cattle and, and uh, servants and the land where they were living together was not able to support them. And so we read in the Bible in, in Genesis chapter 13 that they decided to put a little distance between them so that um, they could have adequate supply of grass and everything for their possessions. And so <clears throat> the Bible tells us this about that time in the story. The Bible tells us that Lot chose the Jordan Valley. He looked he knew what it was like. He looked and it was a very prosperous place to be. And the Bible tells us that Lot pitched his tent as far as Sodom. But the men, this is Genesis 13 verses 11 to 13. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Now, when, um, when Lot chose his place to live because it was beautiful. It's been sometimes referred to as a tropical environment. He didn't choose very well. He chose from the outward appearance of things. And right here, he knew already what it was like in Sodom. It was not a surprise. They went around, they knew. He knew what it was like there. He knew a little bit of what it was like anyway. And right there is the first big lesson that we want to think about this morning when we think of the story of Lot and his family and the city of Sodom. Well, <clears throat> Lot is a faithful believer in the true God. He left Ur of the Chaldees just like Abraham left. They worship the true God. How many years had they worshipped at the same altar together? He was a, a devoted believer in the true God of heaven. Second Peter chapter 2 that we read from in our scripture reading this morning tells us a little bit about the character qualities of Lot while he was even living in Sodom. So don't forget these qualities are uh, mentioned about Lot while he is even living in Sodom. It says that <clears throat> it uses the term righteous three times in those, in those few verses that we read in our scripture reading this morning. He was righteous. He was righteous. He was righteous. It also tells us that he was vexed with the filthy conversation. That's the King James. The filthy conversation of the wicked. And he vexed his righteous soul from day to day as he listened and he looked about the, on the things that were going on in Sodom. Now, if you have something other than the King James, verse, you, uh, King James Version, you'll see a little bit of a difference there when you look at these verses because the King James uses the word conversation. He vexed, he was vexed with the filthy conversation and no doubt there was filthy conversation in the city of Sodom. I'll just tell you, as a nurse, <clears throat> I've been shocked by the filthy conversation of my uh, the nurses that I work with. 
and once in a while, oh, sorry, Bob. They know that's not a part of my vocabulary. But when you look up the word conversation, the, it, is an, it is actually being used in an old English sense in this word, in this, in this verse. It actually means behavior. So it's really more clearly or deeply would say he was vexed with the filthy behavior, the filthy conduct. He saw, he knew what was going on there. He listened. He walked around town. He, he interacted with everybody that was there. He listened to what they were talking about. He saw what they were doing. He saw the wickedness of Sodom. And it also says here that <clears throat> he vexed his righteous soul as he listened and looked upon what was going on there. Well, did you ever look up the word vex? I think we kind of have an idea of what it means. Did anybody ever vex you? Well, <clears throat> some other words that can be used for that as well is annoyed, upset, irked. Did you ever get irked by somebody? <clears throat> Irritated, angered, aggravated, exasperated, or bugged. You know, what, Luke, what Lot saw there and and was around in Sodom, it bothered him. He did not like what he saw. He knew it was wrong, and he did not participate in it because the Bible says that he was a righteous man. But he stayed there. He stayed there. Well, <clears throat> what happened? Because he stayed there. Well, <clears throat> kind of jump ahead in the story for just a moment. <clears throat> a little bit later on in the story, Lot is sitting at the gate of the city one day. Two visitors come. They look like normal people. They're actually the angels of God that have come to destroy the city. Uh, he invites them to his place. He has to urge them and almost compel them because he knows what Sodom is like. He lives there, he's heard it, he's seen it, he's around it. His family is there. They finally accept his invitation before the evening is over. There is a mob of men, young and old, the Bible tells us, that is outside the door of his house. And they want Lot to bring those two men who are strangers to this town out for them, the implication being that they were going to have sexual activity with them. How does Lot respond to that? Well, he tries to reason with them to begin with that this is not right. Uh, they accuse him of being a judge over, over them. Uh, Lot's next response is, well, I have two unmarried daughters here. Why don't you take them? Now, wait a minute. This is a righteous man. He is vexed with what is going on in the city, but he's around it constantly. And this was another point that I had just never thought about in the story before. Here is this righteous man living in this city that in just a few hours will be destroyed because of its wickedness. And he's offering his two unmarried daughters to that, that mob of men that are outside his door. What has happened to Lot? <clears throat> and and I, I begin to think that he has been affected by the environment and the society and the neighbors that are there. Unknowingly, what, it was just like, I don't know if he had a twinge when he, when he offered his daughters to them or not. But he did. Lot was affected, although he did not participate in their wickedness. Lot was affected unknowingly by his surroundings. You know, it's the same for us. We're affected by our surroundings. And we may not know to what extent even 
that we are affected by our surroundings. How careful should we be about these things? Well, that's Lot was affected. What about his wife? And a little bit later in the story, we read she didn't want to leave, and actually Lot didn't want to leave either, even though the angels have said, hurry, we are going to take you out. This God has sent us to destroy this city. They didn't want to leave. This righteous man did not want to leave this city that was about to be destru- destroyed. <clears throat> And Lot's wife's heart was in Sodom. Her children were there. Her possessions were there. You read in the book Patriarchs and Prophets that they had a luxurious home. The the wealth of their lifetime was invested in that city. They they, They were well off. And they didn't want to leave it behind. They struggled. And so uh, maybe at this point would be a good time to mention it. I don't know if, and this is not a commercial, but this is a recommendation. There's a a new commentary that has just been published by Andrews University. I want to recommend it if you like to study the Bible. I'm going to recommend this book to you. It's called the Andrews Bible Commentary. It has just come out. It's just a few months out. It is written by over 60 Bible scholars from all over the world. It's in a narrative format, so it's very easy to read and follow. And uh, as I have read the section for the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, I have been blessed tremendously. So I just want to say, if you, wanna, if you want some, some recent, up-to-date Bible commentary, you can go to... Um, Andrews University Press, and you'll see it right there. You won't have a hard time finding it. <clears throat> well, what effect, uh, well, I want to just say, uh, it was painful for them to leave Sodom. And it might be painful for us to make the changes that God wants us to make. You see that in their experience. They did not want to leave. Even the righteous man. You know, when God calls us to make changes in our lives, it might involve difficulty and pain. But he doesn't ask us to do anything. What effect did this have on his sons and daughters living in that city? What did they grow up with? They grew, you know, what, you know, you grow up with your friends in the neighborhood, right? That's what I did. You go places and you do things together, you talk, you you go to school together, you know, how many, you have friends and associates, you're at their house, they're at your house, all of that, the sons and daughters of Lot, they found their friends in Sodom. And most of them didn't leave Sodom when Lot told them that God was going to destroy the city. They decided to stay right there. However, there were two, the the two youngest girls of Lot were mercifully taken by an angel and helped out of the city. However, what effect had living in the city of Sodom upon them? Well, uh, this was something that I got from the Andrews Bible Commentary. Lot offered them to those men, offered a sexual advantage to those men. But later when Lot is living in the cave with his daughters, they practice a sexual sin against him. Well, where did they, where did they learn about those kinds of things? You know what I mean? They were affected by the associates that they lived with in the city of Sodom. And when they left the city of Sodom before it was destroyed, the seeds of the wickedness that was in that city left with them. How tragic. I don't know whether they realized their their values had changed because of their associates, because they lived in that city. They were changed. 
And they may not have realized it. They just thought they were doing what they should. Also, maybe it would be good to mention at this point, <clears throat> and I say this in all kindness, <clears throat> and that's because <clears throat> when the mob is outside the door of Lot, and Lot offers his daughters, they don't want his daughters. They want the men. This may be one of the first places in the Bible where homosexuality is referred to. And I'll just say briefly that in what God did to that city and those men and those inhabitants in that city ought to be a clear, if you had nothing else in the Bible, it ought to be a clear understanding of what God thinks of that kind of activity. Well, where would God want us to live at the end of time? Because the Bible tells us as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. It's going to be like that again, and it is already here in case you didn't know it. Where does God want us to live at the end of time? Well, I don't know. Can you handle three quotations? I hope so. Few realize the importance of shunning so far as possible all associations with unfriend to those who are unfriendly to religious life. In choosing their surroundings, few make their spiritual prosperity the first consideration. Parents flock with their families to the cities because they fancy it easier to, easier to obtain a livelihood than in the country. The children, having nothing to do when they're not in school, obtain a street education. From evil associates, they acquire habits of vice and dissipation. The parents, seeing all of this and realizing that it will require a sacrifice to correct their error, and so they stay where they are until Satan gains full control of their children. How tragic. How many times has that happened? Better sacrifice any and every worldly consideration than to imperil the precious souls committed to your care. They will be assailed by temptations, but should be taught to meet them. But it is your duty to cut off every influence, to break up every habit, to sunder every tie that keeps you from the most free, open, and hearty communion, committal of yourselves, to the family of God. Instead of crowded city, instead of the crowded city, seek some retired situation. That may be different for each family. What is a retired situation? But that's what we are recommended for. Where your children will be so far as possible shielded from the temptations and there train and educate them for usefulness. All who would escape from the doom of Sodom must shun the course that brought God's judgment upon that wicked city. Don't move to Sodom. If you're living in Sodom, ask God for help. Second quotation, the truth must be spoken whether men will hear or whether they will forbear. The cities are filled with temptation. We should plan our work in such a way as to keep our young people as far as possible from this contamination. The cities are to be worked from outposts. Said the messenger of God, shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. And then finally, and now instead of seeking expensive dwellings here, we should be preparing to move to a better country, even a heavenly. Instead of spending our means in selfish gratification, we should be studying to economize. Well, how different might the story of Lot be if Maybe he was, he didn't listen maybe to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He looked to the temporal advantage. 
and the world is fast, if not already past, what Sodom and Gomorrah were like. Do you ever remember hearing a quotation by Billy Graham about Sodom and Gomorrah? Did you ever hear it? If God doesn't come pretty soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah because of what's taking place in the world right now. Well, we move on in the story of Lot and his family and Sodom. <clears throat> the next time we see Sodom mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 14, where Lot and his family have finally, they have been taken captive. This is before the destruction. Along with the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah as well. And um, if it had not been for the presence of Lot and his family in that city and Abraham's relation to them, if Lot hadn't been there, probably we would never have known about Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, when they were all taken captive, that probably would have been the end of them right there. But Lot was there, and Abraham went with his 318 trained servants, and with the power of God and the, the mighty angels of God on his side, they were able to defeat that other foe and to rescue everyone, his family and everyone in Sodom and Gomorrah as well. You know what I see in that part of the story? Uh, I see a pre-judgment upon them because of their lifestyle. God wasn't there protect, protecting the people of Sodom and Gomorrah because of, of what they were like. God allowed them to be taken captive as a warning to change their lives. However, they didn't change their lives and they went deeper into sin as well. <clears throat> Lot was, uh, God was giving them light when Abraham had finally rescued them he gave credit to God. Melchizedek, you know, Melchizedek comes at that time. He says it was God that did it. <laughs> With the 318 uh, servants of Abraham, there's no way that they could have defeated that great army other than by the power of God. And the inhabitants of Sodom realized you know, that the, his God must be great for them to be able to be so small and so successful. God was giving them light, and yet they did not benefit from it. Well, then we come to the last night of Sodom. <clears throat> Abraham, and there's several parts to this story. The intercession of Abraham, the day before. The angel's arrival in the city. They're lodging at the home of Lot, the mob outside, Lot's failed attempt to warn his sons and daughters, and finally, the merciful act of God in helping them out of the city that they did not want to leave. <clears throat> uh, so just we'll back up in the story for one second. When God has finished talking with Abraham, you remember he says, am I going to hide from Abraham? He's going to be a great nation one of these days. I'm not going to hide from him what I'm going to do. And so <clears throat> he says, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to go down and take a look for myself of what's going on in Sodom. And so uh, before Christ leaves, the Bible says this very interesting thing about Abraham talking with God. The Bible says in Genesis 18, verse 22, Abraham stood before the Lord. And you remember, he starts with 50, goes to 40, 30, 20, and finally to 10. But the Bible says Abraham stood before the Lord. In the Andrew's Bible commentary, it says this, that in the Masoretic text, 
That's the Hebrew Old Testament. The Masoretes were people that copied and preserved the Old Testament for us today. But beside this text of eight, Genesis 18, verse 22, there's a little note in the Masoretic text, and it says this, it's been reversed. Our Bibles say Abraham stood before the Lord, but the Masoretes said it is the opposite. The Lord stood before Abraham. Now, what would be the significance of that? Well, uh, this commentary just suggested this. When you are standing before someone, you are standing there in the position of a servant. You're standing before the king. You're standing there as a servant. What would you like me to do? Where would you like me to go? You know, here I am standing before you, and I am your servant. You know what I mean? When you're standing before someone, that phrase in the Bible the person who is standing before someone else is standing in the position of a servant. Can you see any light in that? Christ standing before Abraham rather than Abraham standing before Christ. Christ is standing there as a servant. And so here we have one of the earliest places in the Bible that would uh, foretell the very life and the very likeness of Christ's ministry when he would come to this world. He came as a servant, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So right here in this text, if this note in the Masoretic text is correct, it, it suggests the entire ministry of Christ. How many times did, is his life a life of service how many people did he touch and heal? How many miles did he walk to, to meet someone, to minister to them? His life from the very beginning to the end is a life of self-sacrificial service suggested right here in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> and then Christ speaking to Abraham says, I will go down and I will see. Did he not know? He knew. But here when Christ, so this tells us, I mean, if we can believe the Bible, Christ is saying, I am going to go and I am going to look. He did. He must have been there that last night in Sodom. What did he see? He saw Lot sitting at the gate of the city welcoming these two angel uh, visitors. He saw the mob outside his door. He saw everything that was taking place. He saw those men and what they wanted to do and what they were like. Yeah, the report that came to me, well, it was right. right. Uh, how must it be for God to witness the human race created in his image and, and look at them now? You know what I mean? That must have hurt for him to see how far they had gone. Christ sees and he knows. <clears throat> God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Ezekiel 33, verse 11 tells us this. As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the de death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way <clears throat> Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? That's where God is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna believe that Christ loved every person in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. But they chose to cling to their sin, and so they chose death rather than life. And the Bible tells us then in 2 Peter verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 7, that he delivered Lot. He delivered someone that was in that city that was righteous. God delivers and God saves. He knows. He knows where we are. He knows what we're like. 
he will deliver those that have given their lives to him. Well, could there be anything worse than what was taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah? And I kind of want to say, I have to confess my ignorance here a little bit. The word Sodom has come down to us, to our generation, in the word sodomy. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it means if you don't know. You can look it up. And if you do, you're going to go, what? you got to be kidding. I looked it up. I just, I was shocked by what was taking place there. But is there anything worse today than what was going on then? Can I share a couple quotations with you? The Redeemer of the world declares there are greater sins than that for which Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Well, what would they be? Those who hear the gospel invitation calling sinners to repentance and heed it not are more guilty before God than were the dwellers in the city of Siddam. And still greater sin is theirs who profess to know God and to keep his commandments and yet deny Christ in their character and in their daily life. Wow. You don't have to do the things that they were doing in Sodom for there to be a greater and a greater sin. If we don't allow Christ to come into our life and transform us, it's worse than what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. If you believe what this quotation is saying, there is cause for alarm in the condition of the religious world today. God's mercy has been trifled with. The multitudes make void the law of Jehovah, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. There's a reason for alarm. Christ declared, as it was in the days of Lot, even shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The world is fast becoming ripe for destruction. Soon the judgments of God will be poured out and sin and sinners are to be consumed. I don't know, that's kind of bringing the story of Sodom and Gomorrah down to me personally. I don't know about you. I never thought that I could ever be guilty of something worse than what was taking place in Sodom by not allowing Christ's character to be developed fully in my life. But that's what I read. Before its destruction, referring to Babylon, the call is given from heaven, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18, verse 4. As in the days of Noah and Lot, there must be a marked separation from sin and sinners. There can be no compromise between God and the world. And so, my friend, God is calling each one of us. You got to come out. Wherever Sodom, wherever, wherever Sodom, wherever the things of this world are in our lives, God's calling us out. He's calling us out of Babylon. <clears throat> Just as there was salvation in Sodom, and I want to thank God for that, there will be salvation from this world at the end of time when Christ comes. And so uh, I've chosen for a final quotation, one more quotation. Uh, the description, a uh, piece of the description of that final, wonderful, great deliverance when God delivers his people from this world. Amid the reeling of the earth, the flash of lightning, the roar of thunder, the voice of the Son of God calls forth the sleeping saints. He looks upon the graves of the righteous, then raising his hands to heaven, he cries, Awake, awake, awake ye that sleep in the dust and arise. Throughout the length and breadth of the earth, the dead shall hear that voice, and they that hear shall live, and the whole earth shall ring with the tread of the exceeding great army of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. From the prison house of death they come, 
clothed with immortal glory, crying, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And the living righteous and the risen saints unite their voices in a long, great shout of victory. There is going to be deliverance. God will deliver his people from this place that has become like Sodom at the end of time. Um, when I first chose, and you'll see in your, in your bulletin, that uh, I chose the song, and I don't see my hymnal up here. Somebody has my hymnal. If you took a hymnal from up here, this one's not mine. <laughs> anyway, uh, the song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. <laughs> and um, that song, when, when I thought about this topic, I said, Yes, that's the song we need to sing at the end. You know what I mean? When Christ is coming, when the world is ripe for destruction, don't pass me by. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. But then I thought of a song that would maybe be even more appropriate, and that is Jesus Saves. Jesus Saves. The song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, was written by Fanny Crosby in 1868, I believe. <clears throat> Fanny Crosby, that noted uh, hymn writer, visited a prison one day. They sang some of the wonderful hymns that she wrote. And at the end, one person shouted out, one of the prisoners shouted out, Oh Lord, don't pass me by. That night, Fanny Crosby went home and wrote the words to the song. <clears throat> pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. But I want to invite you, <clears throat> because I, I want to say if, if it is your desire for God to not pass you by, I want to invite you to stand as we sing our closing song, which is number 340, that Jesus saves, Jesus saves.
Father, Jesus, Son of God, and the Holy Spirit, thank you for the plan of salvation. Thank you that you are in the process of saving every one of us. Link our heart more closely to you and the things that you are like that we might be able to sing praises to you throughout eternity. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. To reach a friend with the Christ-centered message of hope and wholeness. This has been Anderson SDA Church in Northern California. Thank you for joining us. For more information, visit our website at andersonadventist.org. We look forward to seeing you next time.